Hey, Wine and Dime listeners, excited to be here today to be talking about something we've heard an awful lot of throughout this, uh, I would say, pandemic, and that's career and possible career changes. In today's episode, I'll actually be highlighting uh, chapter two from my book, Uncork Your Finances, because that does talk about both career and employee benefits. But before we dig into that part of the show, we want to promote one of the wines from a winery we've been exploring throughout the month of August, and that is a dry rosé from a winery called Vice. And it's a combination blend dry rosé, predominantly Pinot Noir and uh, Belfrancish, which is actually also known as Lemberger. And uh, we have really been enjoying it this summer. It's been a great refreshing wine. If you haven't tried it already, you can certainly order it from their website or a lot of the local uh, New York uh, wine, or wine shops carry it as well. So the dry rosé, give it a shot, uh, promote them. And, uh, you know, if you can't travel, at least have a little bit of Germany by your side, as we've said throughout the month of, of August. So digging in a little bit, as you know, I always start every week with the same sort of concept that... Life is a journey, right? So it's a, it's my goal to share a story of someone's journey through their life and financial vineyard. And we try to take you from their roots to the journey of their vines and the influences in the air that have helped craft their delicious lives. And like wine, life and finances have different palates that should, should be celebrated and not judged. And I can tell you from first experience, I have made many job changes, not so much career changes per se, but I've always liked what I've done. I just haven't necessarily always liked where I was doing it. But that in and of itself can be considered a career change to a certain extent. So when we look at changing careers or looking to see if you actually like your career, the question is, is it the job or is it the company? So I would say, you know, I always take like each year and pick a theme to live my life by. I know that sounds a little crazy, but I pick a word or a theme or something along those lines. But it's amazing how it really drives your life when you focus on it. I'm going to take you back to 2014 when Brent and I experienced a loss of two family members. One was an uncle on my side and the other was an uncle on his side. It really made us take a step back and ask if we were leading the life that we wanted to to live. And part of the answer to the question was yes, but part of the answer to the question was no. And again, many people during this pandemic have sort of taken a step back and and have asked me, you know, what would their financial plan still work if they made a career change? And, And I've asked them, is it a career that you want to change or is it just the company that you're working for? In my case, we loved what we were doing, but not necessarily where we were doing it. Anyone that knows me knows winter is a cuss word for me. Yeah, it pretty much is, or rather it was, I should say. I also don't feel like I was you know, fully using the talents that God gifted me. So I started to have a conversation, conversations with companies that you know, I was in conversations outside the company, mentors potentially thought about starting my own business. And if you read the about me section in the book, you know, it was the the backup plan that actually won. <laughs> well, I guess sort of. In 2015, my motto was year of development. I was going to develop a plan that would work with people like me, middle class, hardworking, and people who worked for everything. At some point, They've had to roll up their sleeves and they've had to get their hands dirty. Every move I made, I went back to that motto. I was one of, um, it was one of the reasons that in December of 2015, I ultimately decided decided to spin off from a joint venture that I had started in, in March, actually April of 2015 into a solo firm, which was called Irvine Wealth Planning Strategies at the time. And now, of course, we do business under Rooted Planning Group since I've expanded the practice so much. It wasn't just Irvine anymore. It's all of us. That led me to 2016, which was my year of recovery, as I called it, because 2015 took a toll on me financially and emotionally. Honestly, I needed a year to rebuild my income, my confidence, and my business. Brent and I worked 
extremely hard that year. And we cut out almost every category of spending in what we call category three item, which if you're looking to get more information on that, uh, that's chapter one of Uncork Your Finances. Knowing it was necessary for at least a year to cut out all of those items. 2017 then kind of uh, got into my growth year. Thankfully, our, our hard work had paid off significantly and we made it through some dark moments. And in 2016, I joined an organization called XY Planning Network and found some amazing financial planning colleagues that were supportive and are now some of my best friends. So I'm very fortunate in that way. They guided me through through both 2016 and my growth year in 2017. 2018 was my year to be brave. I remember uh, talking to my business coach at that point in time, who was Arlene Moss, and telling her that that was my motto for the year. And I heard such a long pause and then an, okay, what does that mean? (laughs) I laid out some issues I had uh, for both the company growth and for my personal growth, and it was aggressive, but doable. Why did I share all this with you? Because it was a journey. It was, it was, um, I guess, what my career needed. In part, a part of our journey was to focus on, you know, growing that particular year. But I wanted to be brave. I was scared. I was scared of doing certain things. I didn't want to look like a fool. I didn't want to make another mis- what I thought was another mistake. But you know, I'm sure you've heard the cliche: love what you do and do what you love. Another way of saying that is life is short. Drink the good wine first. Our career are such a big part of our life, or at least mine is, that we should spend some time focusing on it. Now, now I'm not the expert in this particular category, but I spent a lot of time in this past year interviewing people who do focus on both career and life coaching. And in 2019, I took it a step further and actually hired Jody Flynn, who is my now both career and life coach. And that was going to be my year to be in Rooted. Uh, Funny that, that goes along with Rooted Planning Group, right? So 2020 was again a growth year and I'm still working on that obviously since this is you know the the getting into 2020 we are focused on growth and rebuilding and um, that whole rebranding that we went through in 2019 is now taking hold. And I got super brave this year when I collaborated with Brittany Castro and purchased uh, her book of business as well out in California. So we've we've been doing some amazing things because we we put the plan in place in prior years. Now, if you're looking for somebody to do some career and life coaching, as I mentioned, Jody Flynn is an amazing coach for me. But there are other coaches that I've interviewed over time, including Ray Geis, which was episode eight of uh, Wine and Dime, and uh, Lynn and Cornette, which was episode 11. Uh, I also interviewed Joanne Allen, which was episode 21, and Cara Sessions in episode 26. There are many other episodes of Wine and Dime that talk about career coaching. And most recently, I had a really fun one about energy levels and the importance of energy level um, and getting to know what energy level you're at. And sometimes, you know, taking the, the risk of going further um, and, and figuring out what's holding you back, right? So if you look at the most recent, um, as of this recording, the most recent epico- episode is with Isabel Rest. Repo, and I'm probably saying her name incorrectly, so I do apologize, but hers was on energy healing. And sometimes we need to take a step back and figure out what's standing in our way and, and we need to release those energies. So hop on over to episode 129 if you want to hear more about that. Here are some questions that you should consider. You may be loving what you do, but are you in the right company? Are you making equivalent wages? That's really important because equivalent wages drills down to uh, 401k contributions, match, potentially any kind of other employer benefit. Are you promoting yourself? That's a hard one for me. That's very hard for me and I have to get better at it. Uh, I admire um, Meg Bartel. She is another financial planner and she recently made a statement when talking about um, how embarrassing it is that we're talking about ourselves. She said, embrace it, lady. If you're anything like me, you totally want to take credit and perhaps feel uncomfortable doing so. I can tell you from 
experience that saying things out loud to other people like I'm good at such and such, or yeah, I was really proud of how I did whatever it is, is wonderful. False modesty is for the birds. I'm going to say that again. False modesty is for the birds. I just found that so profound because each of the coaches I've interviewed said, you've got to promote yourself since you're the, you're the one who cares the most. The thing is, if you aren't getting your maximum pay, like I said, it affects so many other financial aspects of your life. I'm not just talking about the spendable income, which is easy to see. I'm talking about the benefits you don't see. Let me ask you a question. If you work for a company that offers benefits each year when you do open enrollment and that rolls around, usually in October or November, how long do you spend on the reaffirmation process? My guess is maybe 20 minutes. Each year, you really need to sit down like I do with my clients and go line by line. Look at new options that are available if they're being added and even old options. We ask why are they participating in a various benefit or why they're not, if those should be changed. And we discuss how it may or may not cost them additional funding. It's a good 60 to 90 minute conversation, well over the 10 to 20 minutes that most people spend. What are some of the benefits that you might have available that could really impact your financial life down the road? What do they mean to you in your life? How would they support a goal? When you think about it, what are the three main, ca- three main categories that you should be thinking about when it comes to your working income? Earning it, saving it, and protecting it. So let's dig in just a little bit deeper. On earning it, compensation comes in many forms. General wages, generally for as base pay. This is usually what you, uh, all your other benefits are based on, right? So making sure that that's maximized is really important. Make sure you don't overlook this fact. Both the savings and the protecting side of the equation can be affected by this number. Other types of compensation might include tips, non-qualified stock options, restricted stock awards, non-qualified deferred compensation, and bonus and incentive plans. Also, you may have some self-employment. And if you are self-employed, you're in a whole different separate category. Unfortunately, you get hit with both responsibilities of Medicare and Social Security. So be sure that you're setting aside 25 to 30% of every dollar in estimated tax payments. And then maybe you have a side hustle as well. If you need a little more income to pay down debt, send the kids to college or save for a big vacation, then a side hustle income is for you. But before cutting your savings rate, On that 401k plan, pick up a little temporary side hustle. Watch for the tax withholding on this, though. Make sure you've looked at your total income and have enough withheld. I know a lot of people will probably disagree with me on this, but I think it is easier to earn more money than it is to cut expenses. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's easier. So under the saving it category, I'm a big fan big fan. Anybody that knows me knows I'm a big fan of Jean Chatsky. And one of the things that she repeatedly says is automate. I agree with her 100%. If you don't see it, you won't spend it. How can you save directly from your company? Well, it might be a 401k, a 403 or a 457. I know you've likely heard all those numbers. These plans allow you to save directly out of your salary. Most of the time they are pre-tax too. But some companies are now allowing a Roth portion. In addition to that, find out if your company will match the contributions. If so, at a minimum, you must be saving whatever your company matches. Ideally, you want to be at least 15% including your company match, and especially if your company doesn't have a pension, which most companies don't. Other ways of saving would include an HSA, which is a health savings account. Now, that's something that if you don't use it, you don't lose it. And you can actually use it in many years in the future. And once you turn 65, you can use the account like a IRA. An FSKA, or flexible spending account, now that is something that if you don't use, you do lose. So you need to make sure that you're not over saving in that category. A 529 is another way of saving. A 529 plan um, allows you to save for education expenses and all of the earnings as long as you use it for education is uh, tax-free. 
Now, some companies will allow you to uh, save through payroll deduction, but if not, then you can always set up an automatic contribution directly to the company. Another place to save uh, automatically is an emergency savings account. And one of my clients actually called it a prospect prosperity fund, which I love that name. It allows you to prosper even if something major jumps into your life. Most companies will allow you to have multiple direct deposit locations. So my recommendation is to pick up a separate bank account and a separate account somewhere where you don't normally look at things and just automate that savings. You could also do it in a brokerage account. If your prosperity fund is fully funded, consider adding to an after-tax brokerage account. And then finally, even consider a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. Once you've fully funded your company-sponsored retirement plan, prosperity plan, and maybe put some money in your brokerage account, funding a traditional or Roth IRA may be a good option for you as well. If your company won't do direct deposit for the funding, then set up the money to come right out of your checking account. The third category is protecting it. You've worked hard and you know to earn what you have and to save it. Don't forget to protect it. Many people don't realize what their company offers and many of the protective products at a very reasonable cost are in place. One caveat I like to remind people, most of these go away if you leave the company. So it's important to coordinate benefits to make sure you don't completely rely just on the benefits offered by the employer. What do I mean by protecting the benefits? Life insurance? Well, I know it's not a fun thing to think about. I get it. But how would your family replace your income if something happened to you? There's basic life insurance often and optional life insurance. And many times the basic is one to two times your earning and optional life insurance allows you to put even more. Then there's disability. This is an area that I see many people under maximize. What would happen if you became disabled? One in four people have that chance. Where would the income to pay your bills come from? You usually have two different types of plans and not all companies offer this, but one would be a short-term disability plan. And for you teachers out there, you have to purchase this. Your district doesn't generally cover it. It's cheap. And because you are purchasing it, it's not taxable if you ever do need it. For my corporate clients, often you are given certain number of weeks full pay, and then there's little or no cost to you. Then there's long-term disability. This is usually defined by anything longer than 26 weeks. I know a lot of people who go with the default plan, which is usually 50%, if the, especially if the company pays for the premium, and then it's taxable to you. So you won't get a full 50%. If you have another option, explore them. I have many clients whose company will offer a 66% long-term disability plan, but you just have to pay a small portion of it. The benefit um, you are paying for is not taxable. So if it's a split thing, a portion of it may be and a portion of it may be not taxable to you. If you don't have a company option, go outside and explore the separate coverage. According to the Council for Disability, as I already mentioned, just one in four of today's 20-year-olds will become disabled. One of my favorite quotes from uh, Warren Buffett is, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. This is so fitting for disability benefits. It just takes a small seed to be planted to protect and shade you uh, all that you have accumulated. If you want to know more about disabilities and how it can affect your life, listen to my podcast interview with uh, Finding Financial Planning Disabilities with uh, Gretchen Caldwell, episode 15. Another big piece that I like to talk to people about when it comes to their employee benefits and really taking the time to dive into their options is their health insurance. This is the one that most people do focus on that I hear the most complaints about, to be honest, and yet can bankrupt you in a day if you don't have it. Remember the good old days when we had one type of health plan to select? Well, that day is long gone, and now we have multiple plans with multiple deduction levels, not to mention a bunch of acronyms that accommodate them. For example, a PPO, which is considered a Preferred Provider Organization Plan. These plans usually have a higher premium, lower deductible, and have a network of providers and are are advisable for someone with major medical issues sometimes. You can go outside the network and get coverage with these plans, but the amount the insurance company will pay may be different. Some companies also allow employees to contribute to that FSA, remember the flexible spending account, along with a plan to help them save for the co-pays and deductibles. Then there's what's called an HMO, which is a health maintenance organization plan. 
These plans usually have slightly lower premiums with, than a PPO plan, but you must see an in-network provider to get the insurance to pay for those services. And then there's a final type of plan, while well, you're working anyways, that's called a high deductible health plan or an HDHP. These plans usually have the lowest premiums, but the highest deductible. The deductible needs to be above $1,350 and uh, $2,700 for family. So for individual, $1,350 for family, $2,700 to meet the IRS definition of a high deductible plan. These plans are great if you have a very healthy family who wants coverage in a major health crisis, if that hits you. You can also set up an HSA, which is that health savings account. Remember, if you don't use it, you don't lose it, which would roll over from year to year and contribute annually in the event you need to meet the deductible in a given year, the money would be there. Now, if you have that kind of, we've done analysis where sometimes the high deductible plans with the HSA are actually better than the PPO plan because many times after you've met the deductible, then the out-of-pocket costs go down considerably or might even be at 100% coverage. Now, when you turn 65, there's also what's called Medicare. And you're eligible for Medicare once you turn 65, unless you have a disability situation, then you may qualify prior to that. I think I could write an entire book, and I think they have written entire books on Medicare in and of itself. So Medicare has three parts to it. Well, it actually has four parts to it, kind of. But there's part A, which is hospital coverage. Then there's part B, which is doctors and labs. And then there's part D, which is a prescription coverage. There's also something called part C, which others might know as a Medicare Advantage plan. And the Medicare Advantage plan may combine A and B, and it may combine A, B, and D. But understand The um, Medicare Advantage plan is a private company providing health insurance once you've reached 65. So you're no longer in traditional, if you take a Medicare Advantage plan, you're no longer in traditional Medicare. You're now working with a private provider to provide you health insurance. You also may have, if you have traditional Medicare with A, B, and a separate plan D, which by the way, Part D plans are always provided by a contract company health insurance company outside of traditional Medicare. But if you have traditional A and B, you may have what's called a supplemental plan or a Medigap plan that you might uh, co- coordinate with those with those two coverage because there is a par- fairly large deductible for Part A and there's only a 20%, excuse me, you might be responsible for up to 20% on the, the doctors and labs. And sometimes some of those labs can be fairly expensive. So many people will pick up what's called a Medigap plan to coordinate or supplement their A and B. The type of plan you select is very, very, very dependent on your health and the medications you take. So don't tackle this one alone. The Office for the Aging usually has someone you can chat with about this. Also, retired military may have some other uh, options available that they should talk to the VA about. I know we spend quite a bit of time each year reviewing this with our clients and working with uh, providers that can help um, help select the right plan. And the thing is, is with the with the health insurance plans like Part D and if you're on a Medicare Advantage, the insurance companies can modify the plan that you're in once a year. So it's really critical to make sure any modifications that they're making don't affect you negatively because once you've made the switch, you're kind of stuck with it. Now, there are some exceptions to that rule, but I won't get into them today. I guess my final thoughts on on this particular topic of career and employee benefits that go along with it is time should be spent to getting to know what your goals are and what you want to be doing and how that you know, focuses on making your life a little bit better. And then also when you do, if you do make a change, you know, looking at some of the benefit packages that are available is pretty critical as well. Spending time to get to know the benefits and fully understand how they can pack impact your life is, is really important. And, and that's why we look at the big picture when we look at compensation, because sometimes you might take a lower pay, paycheck, but have a lot better benefits that will help you in the long run. I know it's not a fun topic to address. I get it, but it's necessary for the benefit of your family and spending that additional 30 to 60 minutes per year uh, digging into the benefits is really helpful. And I'd like to point out two additional podcasts that touch on some of those issues, especially around the medical field and how important it is to seek advice and assistance. 
Uh, so there's um, episode 17, which is the mental health stigma with Raquel Hinman. And then the total wellness uh, episode, uh, July 26, 2018 with Karen Kramer. Those are, excuse me, Kramer, Karen Kramer. Those are really good episodes that you can listen to. Both are worth a second listen. Even if you've heard one, they were quite a few um, years ago at this point in time. And they touch on very important topics, such as when we're dealing with mental health and beyond that. It's an issue that's so taboo yet common and can be very costly if not properly managed. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Wine and Dime, and we hope that you are able to take some time to sit on back, sip your favorite beverage. And if you wouldn't mind sharing this episode, liking it, providing your comments, we want your feedback. We want to know what you want to know more about. We'd be happy to interview different people in different areas that you know, might pique your interest and, and get further down the road into these particular topics. But we want to thank you very much for listening to this podcast, and we hope you enjoyed the show. And that will about do it for today's episode of Wine and Dime. You can contact Amy through the website, www.rootedpg.com or amy at rootedpg.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at rootedpg for the latest news. And if you have any questions, comments, or topics you would like to hear about, feel free to let us know. And don't forget to rate and subscribe the show wherever you get your podcasts. And again, thank you for listening and be sure to tune in next time.